Spending under $50 all up, I think I got pretty good value for money. Let's have a look inside these bags and I'll let you be the judge. We have here a box of variable capacitors. Air spaced, they probably have a maximum of maybe 250 picofarad. They'd be quite good for crystal sets or variable crystal oscillators. They are two gang, the gangs are a bit different from one another. These were quite commonly used in older style AM radios. Now when you do buy these capacitors, just have a look at them carefully. Make sure that their rotation is smooth. When you get back home, or you might even want to carry along to the sale a little multimeter, just to make sure that the plates aren't shorted or there's other problems with them. If we take a look at this one in particular, you'll see that some of the plates are bent. This is not going to be a very good variable capacitor unless you can find a way of straightening them out. And it's a bit hard to convey over the video, but you might find there's a bit of stiffness or if you do this in a quiet room, you'll hear the plates touching. So, yep, this capacitor, certainly it's rear gang, does need a bit of work if it is going to be made useful. Here we've got some books. The famous radio communication handbook from the RSGB. Uh, not the latest edition, but the ones that I've got are even older. So this adds a slightly newer one to my collection. This one, paperback edition, 1982. So a lot of circuits, a lot of ideas for the constructor, especially in books of this era. Just one dollar. These are a couple of books by the famous Drew Diamond VK3XU. Absolutely full of radio projects, highly recommended. I'm sure I've mentioned them previously. Anyway, these for just $5. Absolute bargain. If you see books like this at Hamfests, make sure you grab them. Now in here there's a couple of items. Now, there are actually three or four of them at the table. I should have paid more attention, but this is a 355C VHF attenuator. 0.5 of a watt. Don't let the VHF put you off because it goes from DC to 1000 megahertz. And if you look at it closely, it's top quality product, Hewlett Packard. And I was told this later on, but when we look at the dial, this is the version of attenuator that has 1 dB steps. There's another version, it was on the table before, that had 10 dB steps, so I should have bought two of them and teamed them up. Then I would have been able to have really good attenuation from uh, in 1 dB steps from lots to very little. Anyway, this goes down to 12 dB, I've got other attenuators so I could team this up and you'll be able to use this to do QRP experiments and see how low in power you can really go and still get contacts or be picked up if you're using say Whisper or FT8. So an attenuator definitely a very very handy piece of test equipment. Also in this bag is, no it's not a CB, almost, realistic, so it's a Tandy product and it is a marine transceiver. Uh, channels here, looks like there's six channels, 27 megahertz AM, you can see the price there, I didn't have the heart to haggle even lower. If it works well, 
it's probably still useless. There's not a lot of 27 meg AM marine activity. But I do have some crystals that I could put this onto other frequencies like 11 meters or 10 meters. But anyway, um, looks like in really nice condition. Hopefully it will work. And with 10 meters becoming open, it could be useful for a novelty little transceiver. Just a few watts of AM on 28 megahertz, possibly, if I've got the right crystals. Normally these require two crystals, one for transmit, one for receive. They're separated by about 455 kilohertz. If you are smart, you might be able to add a DDS VFO, and that can give you more frequency agility than just the crystals. So yeah, if I didn't have crystals, then I probably wouldn't have purchased this rig but I do, so it could be a fun little project. Inside the TRC-11 marine transceiver, normally with this, the power amplifier transistor is near the antenna socket. That big transformer there is for the modulator. Smaller transformer there for the audio amplifier. Then under a speaker, a lot of other circuitry, um, including the receiver IF. It's pretty basic, no frequency synthesizers, all analog circuitry, a bit like the ICOM IC202. And there's one crystal for the transmit and one for the receive for each of the six channels. So these radios were again quite expensive to make, especially if you wanted multiple channels. So pretty soon after this came out frequency synthesizers made it a lot lot easier we've got our 27 meg marine transceiver set up connected to a 12 volt battery the moment of truth well it's receiving So yeah, very healthy receive sensitivity. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Here are the frequencies. Uh, you might be able to see them. Anyway, 27.860 to 27.960. Channel B, a dash, probably because they've taken out the crystals for 27.880 which is the most common frequency maybe they've put it in another radio or maybe there's a fault with a crystal so yeah six channels on 27 meg am marine not widely used these days though you still see signs at marinas and piers saying that 27.880 is being monitored Having fiddled with the crystals, it was a bad connection, and 27880 works. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And it varies when I move the microphone around. There's a spot here where it goes away. The box is plastic, possibly because it's a marine transceiver, there'll be salt water and corrosion. Maybe it was a good idea, but on the other hand, as far as RF goes, a metal case would have been better. Therefore, there's a risk of poor shielding, meaning RF more likely to get into the microphone. Here's an example of what happens if you've got a bad capacitor. Now the capacitor I'm talking about is a large electrolytic, typically about 470 to 1000 microfarad, and it's across the supply line. As you can tell, that noise has almost completely gone with the capacitor connected across the old one. So 
Yeah, I'd definitely say that the old capacitor is faulty and should be removed. The good thing is that they are about the same size and in this application the old one was 470 microfarad, new one 2200, not going to make a lot of difference. As well as replacing the big capacitor across the supply rail, I've also replaced some of the electrolytics in the audio chain. Um, and I think that's improved the results. No longer getting that horrible tone that we were getting before. Now, the last item we have, it's the biggest, the heaviest. Now, can you guess what it is? Um, it didn't look very promising. Powers on no TX. So, a bit of a gamble. But, can you guess what it is? There's an antenna there, a power connection. It is an ICOM. Yeah, no, I didn't pay that price for it. I paid a bit less. But it is the famous late 1970s era ICOM 202. It's a SSB transceiver for two meters. So, yep. Um, it could be useful for mountain topping, two meter VHF field days. These were very popular in the day. And for something like summits of the air, they could be a lot of fun. Uh, this one has a telescopic antenna. It's got a um, uh, position for a strap, so you could have it around your shoulder and be operating two meters SSB pedestrian mobile, something that was a novelty at the time. Now, of course, you've got the FT817, which is about half the size and weight and does way more bands. But these reputedly had very good RF performance, so it'll be a lot of fun to apply some power and with any luck to get this on the air the ICOM 202 and there are other models like the ICOM 502 and I think there's also a 70 centimeter version so that is my pile of stuff around $50 in fact a bit less from a local ham fest if you've never seen inside an IC202 before here's a look through one side anyway most notable here is the crystal filter. A lot of tuned circuits. These would have taken a lot of money to build and a lot of effort to align. That's why single band sets like this were great for operation on one frequency or a narrow band. They were very expensive and not very many amateurs could afford lots of them. Today's broadband equipment is much much cheaper but there are disadvantages like RF performance isn't necessarily as good with broadband as with narrowband gear where you've got high RF environments so a lot of slug tune coils trimmer capacitors and of course this was very much when everything was analog including the tuning readout and frequency synthesis and as you can see from the yellow sticker, it was sold by Vicom, which was a major ICOM retailer in Victoria in the 70s and 80s. The power amplifier would be about in the middle of the screen on the transmit side. The crystal filter here, the IF is 10.7 megahertz. That would be common, I think, for both the transmitter and the receiver. A couple of ICs, definitely all through hole and no surface mount. So, very intricately designed, a lot of partitions and shielding. And in its time, it would have been quite a wonder to have packed all this in a case as small as this. Here's the other side of the IC202. About half of it is a battery compartment. This is nine C-sized batteries. Looks like it's never been used and I don't intend to use it. Here is the variable crystal oscillator, which is the heart of the transceiver. 
there are three crystals here. This one covers 144 to 144.2. This one, 144.2 to 144.4. And this one up here, there's a position here that doesn't have a crystal. This one up here is 140. 5.8 to 146 which is the satellite segment I'm not sure if this was standard or optional here are the adjustments for them a good sign we're getting something out of the receiver the controls might need a bit of work Oh, 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 T817 here, I'm on 144.4. One, two, three, four, five. 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 Well, apart from the IC 202 being a little bit out, about 5 kilohertz off, it's working on both transmit and receive. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, well, uh, probably not too far off the right uh, sort of beam heading for you, so uh, I'll bring it down a little bit further, it might be a bit stronger, but you're pretty good signal. Uh, you'd be a good uh, 5 and 7 at least, VK3YE, VK3XL. 3 watts to a telescopic rip. Oh, I see 202. Uh, right, I, I had a, uh, I see 602 uh, many, many years ago and uh, managed to work uh, VK0 at Macquarie Island using it, it with um, a horizontal dipole on 6 meters. Three Y E V K three XL. You know where it's all, Peter. Yeah, I'm in Mary Warren South, uh, so uh, between Derek and you, in, in a pretty pretty reasonably straight line, I'd imagine. But uh, yeah, only about five kilometres uh, to the southwest of uh, Berwick. So uh, all good. Hey, well, great to be uh, your first contact on the little rig. It's sounding fine, so uh, there's no uh, issues with the audio. You say it's uh, 5 kilohertz out, but I make we're uh, spot on uh, 144-100 at the moment. Uh, and I'm uh, using a, um, uh, uh, what am I using? I see 9700 9, and uh, should be close enough to 100 watts in uh, a 12 element Yagi at uh, about 10 metres. So that's our look at a typical ham radio sale. The prices and equipment you get will obviously be different different sales, different countries, etc. But if you are wanting to get into amateur radio for a low price, then one of the best things you can do is to go to one of these sales, particularly if you're with an experienced amateur who will have an idea as to what pieces of equipment are okay, what are not, what prices are reasonable, what are possibly too much, and also whether you're likely to be wasting your time and money or not. Not going to be 100% successful. There will be some things that you buy that you regret. Other times there'll be things that you really wish when you get back home. Yeah, I should have bought that. But anyway, a lot of fun and it's a way to get on air or improve your amateur radio equipment capabilities for a modest cost. Often much less than what you'll see on eBay. Do you want to get the most from your portable QRP operating? Good Antennas is a great place to start. Find out how I succeed with my two books, Hand Carried QRP Antennas and More Hand Carried QRP Antennas. They're big sellers with favourable reviews from all around the world. To learn more, visit vk3ye.com or search the titles on Amazon.